Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Joanne Michael Show. Tonight, I have with me four very distinguished guests to talk about a subject that's dear to my heart, and that is custody in court. And I guess it's something I learned about quite by accident and not through any wish of my own. Um, and I thought, since it's so filled with horrific experiences that are totally unexpected for the average person like myself, I thought that um, a few average people could come on my show and discuss some of the problems and how judges can actually take your children away from you. It's a really, really interesting uh, experience when you go before people who have absolutely no authority, uh, well they have the authority, but they have no real qualifications to rule about who should do what, um, husband, wife, uh, the state, whatever, but they do have the power to do this and it is very frightening and I think it's about time we spoke about who was doing what so that some of these judges are accountable for the absolutely outrageously unjust and unfair decisions they make in court. Um, perhaps if this is aired in a public forum like this, television, um, a few of them will be more careful about what they do and we'll all be better off. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce my first guest, John Hurd, who is a resident of the Hudson Valley. Ulster County, and he has taken time out of his day to come here and tell you about his custody case. Thank you, John. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, my custody case. I'm going to tell you all about my custody case. Well, yeah, we only questions. have 15 minutes, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to have to talk I don't fast. I want to get started on that. But, it's been um, 10 years. You've been in court for I've been trying to get out of a certain judge's court. The name is Gangel Jacob. She's Where a monster. Is she? She's in New York City. My son's lived here all his life, yet I've been denied venue so that she can stay on my case. She is literally on my case. She gives where me does nothing. The, where does the mother of your son live? She lives in uh, Marble Town. Okay. So you live in Kingston. She lives in Marble Town, but you're in court in Manhattan? Right. Okay. Can you explain this? Because I don't understand how that can be. I don't either. I can't explain it. It's, uh, it's just a... She decided that she wanted to hold on to my case, and she's the, you know, in spite of the fact that I've been to Baltimore, I've been in court in Kingston. Every time the mother comes in and says, no, no, Judge Gangel Jacob is the boss of this case, and all the judges defer to her. I see. So because she's an expert. She's an uh, experienced. She's, uh, she knows all about Ulster County sitting in uh, Murray Hill, Manhattan. But as I recall, New York Magazine She's a monster. did a piece about divorce court and custody court, and they called her specifically a man-hater. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they called her that? She delights in punishing men whose uh, exes or whatever the circumstances drag them into court, and she likes to do things like, say, write a check now in front of everybody, pay her now. Uh, she was written up uh, years ago host of uh, attorneys complained about her and she refused to appear before a judicial conduct board. She, she was shuffled to off the matrimonial bench because of her bias. Her bias though is not just bias because I think you can be judiciously biased if that's you know an oxymoron, what do you call that? An but oxymoron. A double negative. <laughs> but uh, she's sadistic as well and she delights in making sarcastic demeaning remarks about the, your character, your your job, what you know, your your uh, there's nothing right about you. Give me an it's example. A, it's an, it's an, um, what does she call you? Cheap, um, abusive. I happen to know how much you're paying. I will not say that, but I happen to know how much you pay this. She's denigrated person. my and I wouldn't career say as a member of my <laughs> profession. I'm denigrated as a member of uh, as a father. But mostly she focuses only on the antipathy between the mother and the father, between the, between the girlfriend in this case and the boyfriend. We were never married. So she, she, she likes to proclaim how she's going to take care. And I mean, like in your case, you and I are 
diametrically whatever Opposed. different. Opposed. Your judge. Uh, a woman. I might a be. woman. You could say her name. Mary Work denied you the assets of your marriage. Mutual. Well, she did it in a tricky way. She didn't quite come out because she didn't have. She forced me to leave my house, or she was going to throw one of us out of the house. It was like a very quirky thing. My, we were in three courts simultaneously because of my ex-husband having the money to put us into three venues simultaneously and drive the courts. So the family court said, I'm going to make a decision by May 29th, and you, or else you better come to some agreement between yourselves. We were living in a house divided. But she did investigate me as a child abuser under uh, ridiculous <clears throat> charges. She did other things that were absolutely ridiculous at taxpayers. Well, it's the arrogance of these individuals that think yeah. that they know better and what is in the quote-unquote best interest of a child better than parents do, and the idea that they accommodate one parent attacking the other parent. It's, all, it's, it's uh, carte blanche. You go into court and you could say, the lawyers, I mean, to have a country that was all up in arms, you know, to the tune of $80 million about Bill Clinton, lying under oath or something like that. I, what, what I see in matrimonial court is judges and lawyers routinely signing off on affidavits that are a host of lies that never come to trial, that are never proven, that you can just about say anything about your ex if, you, if, 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 if that's who it is, and it's never questioned. And it's, it's almost like you're expected to. But, one so, of, but if you come into yeah. that situation with a biased judge, one side of those allegations is heard, and the other is just summarily dismissed. dismissed. And what, with me, uh, the issue of deep pockets was always at play. With you know, my, the, for instance, this judge uh, elected not to have my son immunized. And what she actually wrote in her order was, since the child has not suffered any of the diseases for which immunizations are provided, therefore he doesn't need to be immunized. And which is absolutely insane. But where did he travel to? It would mean that to? my son would have to contract polio before he could get a polio vaccination. But where was he traveled to last <laughs> summer? You told me he went to. That's summer. not. But the, but the that, point I'm getting at, in other words, in that in that instance, then the judge, this judge Gangle Jacob, just took a year and a half to come up with this paragraph regarding immunization to make it seem as though she had spent, you know, hundreds of, of hours deliberating or, 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 or listening to expert testimony or really discussing the issues of non-immunization as opposed to immunization. But what about your input? And handed me there? the bill, which was $150,000. Wait, she, you had to pay all the I had to pay the, the mother's fees, legal fees, fees as well as mine for a judge that wasn't doing anything more than literally pulling this, this remark out of her butt and saying, this is, this, is, this is my decision. I'm not going to have the child immunized because he hasn't suffered any of the diseases for which immunizations are provided. Hey, then none of us would be immunized. Hey, $150,000 right? later, that was written up in a 97 order, and that's what I could do with my request. Could you or, appeal or, that? As, as well as others. As well as, yeah, you could appeal it if you got ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Now, what if you took your son to be immunized on the sly? I would go to jail. Is that true? I could legally go to jail. Okay, so your attempt to <laughs> save, my son to a doctor, save your to son's jail. life, yeah, well, in effect, because a lot of these diseases are, are the New York Times, according to the New York Times, there is a resurgence of all kinds of stuff, people coming into this country. So if you are concerned enough about your son's house, health, you could be incarcerated for taking your son for I a vaccination. My, I could be incarcerated for taking my son to a dentist or a doctor anytime. Now, the why don't you have the input? Custodial input, some kind of input. You're paying thousands of dollars. Well, it was right? because I. Why put, don't you have say was, over how? Yeah. No, just, just slow down. It was because <laughs> I put in front of this judge allegations regarding my son's welfare, and and characterized the mother's care as negligent. That they therefore decided to shut me down, by making it impossible for me to use doctors to make those allegations. And they decided that the only reason I was making those allegations was because I was quote unquote abusing the mother. In other words, the substance of my allegations was never, was never, it never went any further than the judge. The judge never called in an expert. The judge never listened to a, a witness. First of all, all the witnesses are 120 miles away, so she won't let the case. And I'll, t I'll give you another example of how heinous this judge is. 
a friend of mine who was in front of this judge whose wife is equally vindictive tried to screw him by moving to New Paltz to make him schlep the distance to see his son. To further make life difficult for him, she applied in front of Gangel Jacob, our judge, mm -hmm. for a change of venue to New Paltz. And the judge granted it. Oh, she granted it. In the for same her, year, I made you. a similar application to Kingston for and a change of venue, you. and she's denied it for five years. And not only on top of that, if she denied it, she's denied me the right to even make application. She's denied me the right to go into court in Kingston. So you can appeal this? And they have all conspired. Taraka, O'Connor, mm -hmm. they've all conspired. These with are Supreme her. Court judges. Yeah. Taraka and O'Connor are Supreme yeah. Court judges. In our Judge country. Taraka had this case in front of him for fully six months, to the tune of eighteen thousand dollars, before he called Phyllis Gangle Jacob and said, "Okay, I'm going to send the case back down to New York City." So I mean, what was the reason for him to hold on to it for four months? Run up a bill, so the and then boot it down to New York, back down to New York City. And these these these, are, these judges are talking to each other. These judges are on the phone with one another. In fact, in his minutes before the court, he said, "I'm going to have lunch." I call her Fat Phyllis, with Fat Phyllis Gangle Jacob in Westchester this afternoon. So Taraka. This is a this Taraka is Taraka was having lunch. Yes, with her? yes. This is a case where a little boy's life has been decided by the sexist, bigoted, sadism, I call it, of a judge, of a Phyllis Gangle Jacob, who is notorious in her tenure for man-hating. Right, that's what And uses said. the life of a little boy to hurt me. Is she married herself? Do you know? Yeah, I think part of the reason her name is hyphenated is because that's her sort of feminist way of including Gango. Jacob. I hate to say this, but my son does have a hyphenated name. Oh, well, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a feminist, too. Well, I hope so. I hope so, too. But, you know. Anyway. Don't get me worked up. I Hey, I'm not getting paid for this, <laughs> this and neither is, are you. There's a shrink in the house. Oh, that's right. He might have some, he might have some comments next about um, our, uh, our interchange here. My question <laughs> is here, and I want to make this clear because a lot of people like me never understood this. In my day, if a woman got pregnant, she either gave the baby up for adoption, or she had an abortion on the sly, or if she had the baby, Let's you know, talk it's about like judges. no. But I want to get Let's this not straight. Talk about abortions. We'll talk about it's my show, John. I'm We're going to talk about what I want to talk right. about for I'm one fine. minute. The point being, you never married this woman. You never lived with this woman. You had a baby with this woman. Right. You are legally respond, and this is something I told my son. You get someone pregnant, you can be hauled into court and be forced to pay. Now, isn't that the case these days? 17% of okay. gross income. Now, I don't think that's right because, hey, what control do you have over somebody having a child or not? Well, it's not just so I much mean, that. It's it. that the judges infer that by seeking more parental time with your child that you're trying to avoid payment. The NOW organization advocates that men in California, by seeking more time, just by saying, I want to see my son. I don't see my son but every two weeks. And three hours on Wednesdays didn't come until ten years down the road. This judge used my child to force me into court to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to see him, especially when he was being, I feel, and can prove that he was being neglected. So I didn't really have much choice. And for the NOW organization to say the only reason that men say they want to spend more time with their children is so that they can avoid paying child support. Before Judith Wallerstein and all these uh, women decided that, the, the, that, the, that men were deadbeats, you know, these, this, the, these, these uh, whatever you call them, rules didn't exist. They demonized men as a result of the divorce procedure. They had to find uh, a scapegoat to create this en enormous bureaucracy that these judges live off this bureaucracy. Right. You know, the judge that awards child support in this state gets a percentage of that, st that child support kicked back by the federal government. So it's in the judge's best interest because it all goes into a slush fund. It even pays through, pays into IRAs and pays into pensions. They, it all goes into the mm -hmm. kitty. It's kind of like the way we, we sort of think of traffic tickets today. Right, there's a 30 you know, It goes into the tax. township fund and uh, you know, no, but the judge a gets a new pair of, of uh, you know, bedroom slippers. But, <laughs> <laughs> but well. uh, the, the child support is What's the word I'm trying to think of? Is matched by federal it's like matching funding. funding. Yeah. 
So the federal government, in order to enhance the state's collection of child support, wants to, you know, it, that, that's an incentive. So if you go into court and a judge says, well, you pay, blah, 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 blah. the more you pay, the more he knows his, his, his then, jurisdiction is going to, his, right. his district is going to be subsidized by the federal then government. That's one incentive. Yeah. And then you have this, this idea of women's rights, if you will, women getting screwed, women didn't, you know, of all these years of women not making any money and being left and destitute with kids and so on and so forth. Well, when you grow, when the divorce rate mm -hmm. grows to 70, 60, 70 percent of all marriages in their first five years, and you are still making the argument that every man out there uh, is a, a, a potential deadbeat as a result of divorce. So what you're doing is it's a priori. You know, you're already, you're, 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 you're branding that man when he comes into that courtroom, and I can show you one example after another of guys that have already gotten papers that are hostile to prior to their first appearance. Mm -hmm. When you come into that courtroom, you're already trying to get out of it. You're, all, you're somebody who doesn't want to pay, so to speak. Well, what about my millionaire ex-husband who pays 225 a month child support, no alimony? Hey. Mary worked, well, that, that, that's it. Mary a worked good, it pretty good for him. That's a good example to hold up, for all the women to hold up and say, look at all these sons of, you know, whatever out there who don't get away with it and don't pay and don't There are a around. lot of them too, John. Well, maybe there, maybe there, I don't think there's a lot of them. Because, be, because before there Judith Wallenstein enough. came up with these bogus one-sided, all Judith Wallenstein did was ask women in her books. All her statistics years later by a guy named Sandy Braver were found to be lies. So the whole concept that a woman takes a 76 or 86 percent drop in income as a result of divorce and the man, or a 26 percent, something, she came up with all these numbers. Yeah. Well, that's so that's where they started mandating child support guidelines and so on and so forth and empowered these judges. I and now the judges, the point I'm getting at is these judges sit on high. They pontificate. The state becomes the arbiter of your child's welfare. You know, they look like the way they're doing such a hell of a great job in the public school system. That's what they're doing with people who are divorcing. They're pretending that they know better. Right. But men, and I hate to get into these discussions of men versus women, because to me, in my experience... Well, you have the, to in the, order to get No, the because court. the men and the women, it's pe people have equally gotten screwed in my... I know as many men who are But, the, but who you are have fair. a lawyer here, and if you ask him, I'm sure he'll tell you that the standard procedure in any divorce procedure is to hold the child back till you get the money you want. Because 95% of women get custody. That's not true anymore. That is absolutely not true anymore. Okay. Joint, I have joint custody, so well, to many, is, many people. This is part of their tactic is, is to not divide true. and conquer. You know, it's like as long as you and I quibble over statistics, the focus of, on these judges is, is lost. Well, you I know, hate the, them. When I you, hate most of them. If you, I brought, think if you brought people but, onto your show and had people actually read court orders that these people write into law, you, I think, would be... That would be it. That's all, that's all you need to do is read. 70% of the men get cut, when in, of custody cases that go to trial, 70% are won by men. That's the truth, John. Now, you may say, well, what gets to true. trial? It is true. Because they have the money to force the system. The system is run by money, and you know that. May the richest person win, that's and that's what happened to me. That's something well, else the judge is going to compensate for by, by claiming that the mother doesn't have the means to fight. What is a man fighting for? No one picked up for? my legal tab. See, I don't want to. And go that's down not the truth. I cannot. I dis well, I don't want to discuss the women's stuff either because I don't believe. Well, you're wrong. There's no such thing as 75% of men coming into court get custody. I said 70%. 70% of men get custody in cases that go to trial. That's the truth in America. And what is in that? The last what percent of cases go to trial? When I don't know. Anybody in a custody dispute had a trial. Well, Trials I cost the state money, and they don't. That's one of the reasons why we're here, is because these judges pontificate and they don't allow trials. I've been in court for 13 years. I've never had a trial. How much money have you got? I've had a judge sit on the bench and say, eh, "Gosh, we're going to have to have a trial." How much money have you gone through in 13 years? A million dollars. Do you that the feel state and the government okay. and the government and the lawyers took and did nothing. I have bi weekly visitation with my son. I see my son three hours on Wednesdays. That's it. If now why would I be in court to the tune of a million dollars? If your if I was happy with that. Okay. If your ex And why would I why why would I be denied greater time with my child on the basis of what? 
if 70% of men get custody as a result they of going do. to trial. They do. No, that they is the truth. All right, I'm not in numbers, in trial, now, I don't know what that that's means. That's a crazy that's statistic, and it's nuts. And to be telling people that is nuts. It's true. I'm not saying that most men aren't doing the right thing. I think most men are, but I think most people are. But when you throw your life into a courtroom, you have judges making decisions, and that's what you allow to happen. You have judges making decisions for you. That's what happens when you get there. Well, you have judges playing God, destroying the American family, pitting the father and the mother against one another, coming up with no, absolutely no workable. I mean, who, the, who wants to be told when they can pick up their own flesh and blood, when they can return it, what he can eat, what he must wear, how much he must pay? by a judge that doesn't even know your child, know you, or know the nature of your relationship. I mean, this is a, this is, a, I, I can't see this as anything but civil war. You know, when the state decides that it is protecting all children from its par from their parents. The state doesn't have a viable alternative to care uh, in place to be playing God in the lives of children of divorce. Well, what? And they are acting like they do. And they do that by demonizing one of the parents. And the, 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 the truth of the matter is, whichever parent it is, or even if it, you know, what they're really doing is, 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 is generating the income to build their bureaucracy and keep themselves paid with pension plans and health benefits. And th these children are our pawns to a, a bureaucratic system that is disgusting. Well, let's These judges are idiots. I agree, but let's see. You think Joe Taraka, you want Joe Taraka to tell you when you can see your son or daughter? He was going through a divorce when I was going through you my want divorce. Phyllis I don't want Daniel him Jacob. to tell me anything. So I mean that's what we should be talking about, not whether men or women or all this kind of stuff, but these well, people it's, that uh, you brought up I don't that bring sexist. up that ridiculous statistic. It's true. I don't, I'm custody. not making up statistics. It is true. It has been oft quoted. Anyway. By the NOW organization. John. You, you have more than covered this subject for us. Thank and you. And I, I appreciated your doing it. Sorry to be uh, for so both. argumentative, but... But it was fine. I like that. You're a spirited person. I'd love to see you in court. Anyway, um, I guess my next guest... It's not pretty. Hey. <laughs> well, obviously, both of us got bad deals from these judges. Maybe we should have a show on court etiquette and tell people to not do what we did and they get better deals. No judge should be telling anybody in this country when he or she can see his own flesh and blood. Agreed. No judge. Hey, we agree on something. Anyway, John, I have to talk to the forensic psychologist and find out, hey, what we should and shouldn't do. Thank we'll talk you, to you for coming we'll check by. your statistics. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome <laughs> to. I Four. Where do three. I look at this one? Okay. Oh, My next guest is Dr. Stephen Silverman, who is a forensic psychologist. That is something that I had no idea what it was until one was assigned by the court to evaluate my custody case. And it is something that I'm still not quite sure of, so I'm going to let Dr. Silverman explain it for us. Well, a, uh, a psychologist who does forensic work is simply one who integrates issues of law and psychology and works with them together. Okay. There now, is no such thing as a forensic psychologist or anything else other than a psychologist because psychology does not, in New York State anyway, has no uh, what they call specialty registries. So there's no specialty. You get a degree in clinical psychology, then you may get experience in other areas of psychology, but you're really a clinical psychologist. But the court appoints you right. to evaluate the mother, the father, and the children, and then to write a report, which is vital, as I understand. My lawyer kept saying to me, this report really matters, Joanne. So, you know, like when you go in to speak to that psychologist, you make sure that you say all the right things, okay? Now, what the right things are, he couldn't tell me. So I just told the truth to the guy and I prayed for the best. Hey, it worked. But most people go in there, they're terrified. And how do you deal with that? They're nervous. I wasn't nervous. I just went in there furious. But how do you deal with these nervous people who would think that they're going to lose custody of their kids if they say the wrong thing to you on high? 
Well, um, you really can't deal with the nervousness because people are, are going to be very threatened by the process and you don't have enough time to, uh, or is it appropriate, to reassure them that the process will be kind and gentle to them. You're really acting as an investigator to a large degree, so you're asking questions that are difficult. You may tell that to the clients when they come in and say, I'm going to ask some questions that may be very difficult, that may be hard to answer. They're important to answer. They're, the questions are important to ask. And, you know, you really can never reassure people because um, in the state that they're in, uh, after working with their attorneys uh, and going through the legal system, uh, many are very paranoid once they get into your office. Right. So if you look at them the wrong way, they think that you're against them. And once they think you're against them, then their attitude and the way they censor material, the way they provide material to you is, is censored and biased. And um, so the psychologist has a, a difficult, if not impossible, task of trying to sort out wheat from chaff. What is, what is important in the evaluation in terms of information and what do you do with the attitudes and the behaviors that you get? Right. Well, it is, to, me, to my way of thinking, I remember I was, I was somewhere traveling the day before I had to go meet with the psychologist. So as luck would have it, the woman I met on this thing, um, her boyfriend had just gone through a forensic psychiatric evaluation. She says to me, now remember, when you go in there, always talk about your child. Don't talk about yourself, talk about your child. So I went in and I said just what she said. I just focused on that and that's what I did. Not that that wasn't the truth, I would have done that anyway. Hey. I wanted what was best for well, my Well, the psychologist kid. really has... But, I, you know, I, I, then you have to say, who's maneuvering you? Who's the manipulator? You know, people married to very intelligent people who are very passive-aggressive, it's a problem. They can, they can, you know, there's people like me, who a lot of people don't like because I'm too honest, and then there's people like some ex-husbands <laughs> who will very often sit there very kind and sweet, you know, Never mind that person tried to arrest you, tried to have you thrown in jail, accused you of having sex in a cage. But that person sits there in the chair and he's so nice and he's so sweet. And the psychologist is sitting there listening to this angry maniac like me thinking, wait a second, the she's psychologist, really crazy. The so I'm trying to ask you how you evaluate all these sort of things. You have to deal on a lot of levels here, right? Well, uh, yes and no. The, uh, the important you. thing is that the psychologist has to take control of the situation and the questioning uh, and not allow the client to just uh, talk ad infinitum about whatever's on their mind or, or about their children in particular. You must take control as you have to do on this show, which sometimes you have difficulty giving your guests. Uh, I don't care you know. about control. But, uh, I render it up. I, but, I, but look, look there, I, are, there are just a couple of basic things. If you're driving at, well, in a short amount of time, uh, what does a psychologist, what kind of information do you want to elicit? Uh, you know, in broad sweeping strokes, you want to be able to determine if someone has uh, any um, serious mental illness that might compromise their parenting capacity. <laughs> uh, then if you can get by that, uh, really uh, the most important question in a custody evaluation um, often is to whom is the child most bonded or attached to. Uh, that's very important. The younger the child, the more important that issue is. Uh, then you want to know um, the availability of the parents, you know, if their work schedules or, or if they don't work, you know, the time that they have that they can spend with the child, that's, that's critically important. What kind of child care uh, arrangements they may need or have um, in place when they're not, uh, when one of the parents is not there, if they're working. And um, uh, from there, uh, if you can separate those issues out, I think your evaluation is over. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest of the evaluation is this utter nonsense you hear from both parties that uh, Mr. Hurd was talking about before, you know, allegations about this one and that one, things that cannot be substantiated generally. You can't prove them. Um, so you don't uh, want to hear that? Well, you have to, to a certain degree. I mean, some of the allegations are, uh, you know, when the parents want to up the ante, of course, and they say, well, you know, the father was touching the child a little funny uh, when they were changing the diaper, <laughs> maybe he's uh, sexually abusing the child. You, you can't really ignore those things because then the judges and the lawyers and the law guardians go, oh my God, you didn't investigate that, as if there's some way to do it. Um, so you, uh, you, you give the clients their time, what you have in explaining mm -hmm. these allegations, and you have to, again, separate out wheat from chaff, make a decision in the time you have. Are these allegations important? Um, I think it takes a lot of experience to, uh, to get a sense of um, what is being done just to uh, uh, 
uh, keep the litigation going mm -hmm. and, to, and to, to make to demonize you know, the other person. Um, of course, then when you don't give that a lot of credit, <clears throat> the next thing that happens is you're asked, well, how come you didn't investigate that? So I, you know, I said, well, if it wasn't important, then if it's that important, get somebody else to investigate it. Uh, do you, you, know, feel you get very jaded point? at some point uh, with all this nonsense. It's, this is a very, I was told by my attorney this is a very critical piece of information in the judge's determination as to who gets custody, okay? Now, do you ever feel you've made a mistake? Certainly. Well, hey, that's, uh, what do Certainly. you do? Can you go back and re, uh, and... If you're, if, one, if you're asked, then you can reevaluate a situation and with the information that you have that, you know, is uh, new or different. But no, of course you make mistakes. Um, okay. You're being lied to by the people that are uh, generally coming to see you. They do not tell the truth. Right. Um, and we are not human lie detectors, so we do make mistakes. And we, we are limited in the amount of time we have to evaluate these matters and the methods that we can use to, to evaluate them also. You don't make home visits. You do it on you the basis can, of an interview. You can, but, you know, again, a lot of this depends on um, who's going to pay for this. Um, you know, I remember I had to pay 50 percent. I had to pay, you know, Mr. Hurd paid the <clears throat> woman's stuff. He wasn't even married to her, and she makes a lot more money than I do. Mm. I had to pay 50 percent of everything. I made less than 10 percent of what he makes while he's sleeping. So what I'd like to know from the lawyer, maybe, my next guest, is who determines who pays and how much. That to me is another, you don't have to even answer that, but what I found interesting about you, because you are, I want, you're the only psychologist in Ulster County, well there's one other, that I have any respect for. And I don't say that lightly. I have, I was a psychology major in college with English, you know, I mean, hey, it ain't a perfect science, let's face it, but there's a lot of abuse in this area. There's a lot of abuse, there's a lot, just like John Hurd was talking about the judges who have no authority to take children away from their parents. The psychologists do the same thing under the guise of being experts. Now, what is frightening to me was going in there and having, I mean, you know, I told the truth to the guy and, you know, it all came out right. But what about the people who tell the truth and it comes out wrong? Now, I heard throughout the county from lawyers and judges who feared you they felt that you sided more times, more often than not, with the fathers. And I was wondering if you might speak to that and say why you think that perception in Ulster County is yeah. held. Well, I think there's really a simple answer to that. Uh, first, I would say, you know, you're talking about statistics before. In the first uh, three or four years that I was doing evaluations here in this county, I, well, I, always, I was keeping um, uh, records of what But you work in Dutchess too, right? Sometimes, okay. mostly in Ulster County. Um, I was keeping records of uh, what kind of um, recommendations I was making. And I think 70%, as you mentioned a number before, 70% or close to it, the recommendations I made initially, which is when I got my initial reputation, were recommendations for uh, mothers having uh, sole custody. Mm -hmm. So um, where this misconception came from is in the uh, late 80s, a psychiatrist named Richard Gardner coined a, uh, uh, a problem, coined a term for a problem in the family courts called the parental alienation syndrome, where you have parents, which are usually mothers, but they're not exclusively mothers, can be fathers too, really overtly or covertly alienate their children against the other parent. And these cases get very sticky because the children present to the lawyers or the court um, and to others as uh, uh, hating one parent. And this gets, you know, everyone wild, you know, how could this be, and this, this parent must be an ogre. They're difficult cases because the parents who get involved are usually very paranoid and very difficult to deal with. Those were the cases that I would get. So of course, I had experience in the area. So, it was so I had a skewed population. So in those situations, many of the parents are women who are uh, they're worried about losing custody of their children, mm -hmm. so they alienate the child against the, um, the non-custodial parent, if you will, the father. And um, uh, they're very high profile. They make a lot of noise. So when I would identify these cases, that would make a lot of noise, and that would bring a lot of attention That's to it. me. And I think it was uh, definitely unfair. And, um, and, and it just, it's another way 
for the system to demonize a figure in the system uh, to make sure that they get what they want. Okay. So psychologists fall into the same trap as the children do. The clients fall into the same trap. Uh, the judges allow it to happen. Um, now, it may be unfair for me to say, but, uh, you know, judges, when we get these orders, uh, they say, well, you know, this evaluation has to be done within 30 days or 40 right. days, you know. Right. They could take six months or a year for their evaluation of the case and to write a decision. And what happens in six months or a year? The litigation continues, there's uncertainty, the anxiety heightens, the, the fighting continues on, and the children, the situations get worse and worse for them. Now, on the other side, what I say may be unfair, the judges may have 300 cases on their docket, or as they say, or in their caseload, I may have 30. Mm -hmm. you know, so they have, they have a, a time factor. How do they get to all these cases? Right. So it's a system problem. Obviously, uh, children are uh, thought of as uh, 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 not important people in our society. It's a lot of lip service. We're going to help out with children. We're going to get this and that for children. Social services is not given any of the resources they need to help children. Um, the courts are not given any of the resources. The, the uh, children are assigned lawyers who are fresh out of law school. The law they, they become law guardians. Yeah. They work for $25 an hour because they have to. And as soon as they get experience in, in the legal system and they grow a little bit professionally, they stop being law guardians. So what does the court, or what does society expect to get in terms of representation for children at $25 an hour for someone who's uh, you know 23 years old out of law school, single and not married? You know, no yeah. children. It, it's absurd. Now, on the one hand, there are good law guardians, well, and clear. there are some good judges also. Yeah. But by and large, the system has failed completely. And um, uh, when necessary, if there's uh, a disagreement, if you can blame somebody in the system, if it's the psychologist, well, we'll blame that person. You know, if it's the judge, we'll blame that person. If it's the law, you know, blame is just spread all around, and there is no regard at all. Min well, there's minimal regard for really what's happening to the children. And anyway, getting back to this point, you let something go for six months in court, and a lot changes, a lot happens, right. and uh, it makes matters worse. So the litigation itself uh, can cause psychopathology, you know, the protracted litigation right. can add to it. And it's always protracted. Oh, litigation it's is always, always protracted. It's always, you know, it's so common to hear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rule on this right away. Right, right away means three months, three months minimum, um, unless it's a child abuse case. Right. Uh, which typically is not a real custody visitation matter. Although they occur in those instances, it's, it's really not too usual. Well, I call Ulster County Family Court the anti-family court because I have seen no behavior that is for children or in their, to their benefit. All that those people do is want to aggrandize themselves. They don't care about your children. It's a really a misnomer. The family court is really anything but. And I have seen it over and over again. Now, there, it's not to say there aren't, aren't some dedicated people. Claire Durst, who's a law guardian, was supposed to be here today, but she had an, a court emergency. Um, what, you know, again, where it, she's, she's one of those people who's running down for an abuse thing, and they, they call a court date immediately, and she doesn't ever know. She's very dedicated, and she has a sliding scale. I might also add that she was my ex-husband's attorney. And I sent her clients. I mean, how many... Lawyers get a multimillionaire off with $225 a month child support. I mean, she did a great job for him. So I sent her clients. But she did make a big mistake in my book, and that was she allowed him to file for sole custody knowing he could never, ever get it. It cost me $15,000 in legal <coughs> fees to Phil Schatz at McCabe and Mack, a nice man. He's retiring on many, many people's 15000 plus. What I was going to say is, you know, how do these things happen? I mean, and then you get pulled into the mix. Now, what's interesting, like John Hurd says, the day of the trial, costs 15000 to prepare for trial. The day of the trial, the judge goes to him, you could sit here for 20 days and 20 nights trying to tell me she's an unfit mother. Ain't going to work. Do you want to do it? Another fifteen grand for her, another fifteen grand for you. I'm going to be here. And Claire talked to him. It was over, like that. So no, I didn't go to custody trial. But preparing for a custody trial cost fifteen grand. I am not a rich person. You know, John went through a million. I went through forty thousand. I have no retirement. I'm getting old. My IRA went to lawyers. What I would like to ask you 
is when you see this kind of abuse, and it's the abuse of the middle class and the upper middle class, it is not the abuse of the poor who get the law guardian for 25 bucks an hour. I had to pay at all the way down the line. I can't afford it, and neither can most middle class people in the Hudson Valley. So what I'm asking you is, can't you do anything in your position to cut this off before it begins? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the only way that I can come at it is uh, when I do evaluate a family um, in terms of the custodial issues and the visitation issues, I try to take a, a broad sweeping view, if you will, of you know, what's important, get those basic areas that I talked about before. And I come from a position that, um, as you should, and you should know this, and your viewers should know this, that there is no research whatsoever, for example, that um, ties a visitation schedule to the development of psychopathology in children. So there's this old-fashioned, you know, Wait, thing. could you say that? Well, there's this old-fashioned, this old-fashioned, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it a different way. I'll try and simplify it. It's an old-fashioned concept. Well, you know, we'll let the father, typically the father, you know, visit uh, every other weekend and on Wednesday night. And that's good enough, because that's the way we do it. Um, and if we do it any differently, maybe it'll affect the child. You know, if we have a split custody arrangement where the parents live close to each other and we allow the child to live with the mother seven days a week and then the other seven days a week with the father, this is very upsetting to the child. So there are these myths that people have in their heads about this, but there is no research that shows there is a relationship between a custodial schedule, a visitation schedule, mm -hmm. and the development of problems in children. Excellent. The thing that creates problems with children is the quality of parenting, and that's what I'm, I think, being asked to try and evaluate. Right. So um, I very often will say, because there's a lot, there is research which indicates that joint custodial arrangements, sharing physical custody, is very healthy for the child, and to me that makes a lot of good sense. If the two loving parents uh, want to love their child, why shouldn't they love them in a maximum amount of way, right. you know, which is time. And um, uh, well, this is other, this other false issue also of uh, joint legal custody. You know, if the parents argue with each other, then they shouldn't have joint legal custody. They I shouldn't argue, be equally responsible. I argue what a ridiculous concept. A lot concept. of people argue with each other. When it comes to my son, we have joint, 50-50 joint time, everything. And you know what? It worked. I, I cannot tell I believe that the state should take joint custody as its norm it doesn't. and work from there. It and doesn't. it doesn't. But it, why not? Why shouldn't it? Uh, well, why not? I'll tell you why not. Why well, I think it's why not. Because um, uh, here's where forensic psychologists, I guess, have really uh, been a dismal failure. Uh, you know, judges have no, no background whatsoever in developmental psychology right. in, in these uh, sort of family issues. They go to a workshop here and there. They learn a little bit in judge school. Uh, that's the equivalent of me saying I've gone to a workshop uh, about uh, contract law, and now I'm a lawyer. Right. You know, it's ridiculous. So, um, uh, so they have a sense of, um, they don't have a sense of what to do psychologically. Um, and they have to go by what their predecessors did. Right and what the history of judging is, you know. So I assume that uh, that's what they do, and they have this notion that uh, uh, sole custody, you know, is, is better for the child. I don't think a mother is better than a father as a parent. I honestly don't. I happen to be a mother because I'm a woman. Hey, I just don't think that I, because I'm a woman, have any greater input to my, should have any greater input into my son than my ex-husband, and I will not tell you what I think of him. That's the truth. And I think if more people felt that way... They don't. They, they, they just don't. I know, but I think that's a mistake. They're old-fashioned, closed-minded. But I think that's the problem. Men in this educated. society need to put in 50% of their time taking care of their kids. And if they did, emotionally and time-wise, forget financially, things would be a lot well, better. If they want and that's, to. If they want most to, of them do want to, Steve. With that most time. of them no, do I, want I, to, I, and they are made to feel inadequate by the women. Listen, a That's judge, a feel. judge who is now deceased, once said to me in his chambers, he said, "Well, we're going to allow uh, Mr. Jones to have uh, joint legal custody," and I was pleased by that in terms of his thinking. But I said, "Well, why?" And he said, "Well, you know, um, my feeling is that it's an ego problem, and it'll it'll just damage this father's ego." if we don't allow him to have joint legal custody. But he was saying it from a positive point of view. You know, he was saying, why should the mother just have all this, uh, this, this sense of control, but it's a false sense. Listen, uh, maybe the lawyer will speak to this if, if you think it's appropriate. But the issue of legal custody is, again, a false issue to me. Because um, uh, there are only a, two or three major issues that parents have to agree upon 
to share joint legal custody. Religion, that, education, and health? Well, basically health and education. Religion, you know. Someone told me religion. Arguable, I, you know, it's well, arguable. Well, why, then but, why uh, did I need to get a religious leader to court for but me? But if you both agree, you know, that's ridiculous. If you both agree what schools you, your child is going to go to, and you, you have no you know, private school or public school, there's no tremendous disagreement there. You both agree on, on what doctors and dentists are going to take your children to. And nowadays, there's no agreement on that. You're ordered by your HMO to go to this one or that one. And you I have don't no have choice. an HMO. There's no choice. Well, very few people do, you know. <laughs> so um, it, it's just a ridiculous issue. And uh, what I do, what I tell people and advise them when they ask is, uh, the important thing is uh, forget about this legal custody issue. You should fight if you have to, for time with your child, the right. you know the physical right. custody, that's the real issue. That's so really if you want to give in you know, to your wife uh, or, or husband and say, well, you can have the sole legal custody, but you can then share time with your child, that's the critical issue, yeah. because that's what's going to help that child develop, is the input of the parent. And uh, well every said. other weekend <laughs> and Wednesday night is, uh, what kind of input do you have? It's a sad situation yeah. well, for the that's child. Well, I agree, and that's what John's fighting. But anyway, thanks for joining me, Steve, and um, I appreciate it. You're welcome. And it was very enlightening. Two. My next guest is Frank Reddle, Esquire who is not only an excellent attorney in Dutchess County, one of the best, he is also an accountant. And if only I had had him when I was going through my divorce, I not only would have had a lawyer, but I would have had an accountant for the same hourly rate. Is that correct, Fred? It is, but I don't know if I would want to represent you. You probably would have driven me crazy. Me? <laughs> me? No, my husband would have driven you crazy. Okay. okay. He was full of tricks. Phil Schatz at McCabe and Mack admitted he thought it was going to be an easy case, and he re he changed his mind. Okay. So anyway, with that, I my, one thing I have to tell you, I don't listen to anybody. Okay. There are two people I listen to, mm -hmm. without asking any questions. My lawyer, okay. Yeah. And my boyfriend of the hour, <laughs> without asking any questions. So I would have listened to whatever you told me to do. Okay. The problem was that. The lawyers I had were stymied by the cunning and um, exceedingly devious behavior. Now, can I ask you to just tell the folks out there that are going through the custodial mess mm -hmm. what to do? Well, as we heard e earlier from Steve and John, this is probably the worst or most difficult area of law to practice in because it's emotion packed. Uh, we're dealing with children and the parents' ability to be able to visit with their children and spend quality time with them. Uh, it's one thing to go through a divorce and say, well, we're going to whack up that bank account and whack up that bank account. Uh, monetary issues are a lot easier. But you could tell from the, the emotionalism in, in John's voice with his desire to be able to spend more time with his son. Um, it, it's, it's a very trying uh, area. Uh, our courts are just overbooked. They're, they're just backlogged left and right. Uh, judges do not have the time or the ability to have a trial on every case. They don't. Um, we also have a problem with some uh, monetary issues in the family court. Whenever a custody case is started, one of the first things that's done is a law guardian is appointed to represent the children. A law guardian is going to be a local attorney uh, that the judge is familiar with. They mm -hmm. have to be certified by the state. They have to go to some classes. Uh, but right now, unless both parties are financially set, the law guardian is only going to get paid $25 an hour out of court and $40 an hour in court. Uh, you're not going to get very many qualified people wanting to serve as law guardians because they just can't, cannot financially do it. You can't run your law office for that kind of money. Judge Amodio in Dutchess County is trying to up that. Actually, in Dutchess County, uh, Judge Amodio and Judge Brands have issued court decisions raising that to seventy-five dollars right. an hour. That's what I read. I mean, uh, it's it's true. Uh, I've read the cases. I think they're uh, they're very good cases, case decisions. But still, at seventy-five dollars an hour, you're not going to have a long list of law guardians. So uh, you have to hope that the law guardian appointed to your case is going to be somebody who diligently will try to do what's in the best interest, mm -hmm. interest of the children. 
that's the, uh, the case standard. That's what the court has to do. The court has to do what's in the best interest of the children. Does it happen all the time? No, unfortunately. Sometimes the law guardian may not have adequate time to speak to the father mm -hmm. or to the mother or to the child. Uh, I honestly believe that the law guardian should watch both parents separately interact with the children. Sometimes the law guardians don't do that. They do make home visits. Uh, yes. She came to my home. Uh, one of the things I thought was really funny, you know, she used my bathroom upstairs and she, um, she looked in the medicine cabinet. All I have is nail polish, you know, but she forgot to close the sliding door. But I, she, she was to go to the bathroom. She was checking on She you. was checking up to see if I used drugs. Sure, she or probably what I took. was. She wanted to and see you know if there what? was a bunch of prescription hey, drugs in there. I lived like a Mormon. But she still didn't like me because she was a neighbor of my husband's lo uh, lawyer. Mm -hmm. And my lawyer wanted to get her removed from the case because she was biased. But I said to him, Phil, if we get rid of her, it's going to make the case go a year longer. So I opted to leave a biased law guardian on the case to get expedite the custody battle. Right. But you know, these are the things that come up in a small town. Yeah, it's, also, it's, it's very difficult um, when you're representing someone um, who does not have temporary custody of the children. Mm -hmm. uh, our system is not perfect, uh, especially with uh, the ease that um, the laws provide getting orders of protection. Uh, it doesn't take much for either spouse to be able to go into court ex parte. That means by themselves without mm -hmm. the other party being there having an opportunity to be heard and make allegations that there is either emotional or physical abuse in the household. If the judge is satisfied that there's at least probable cause to believe that those things take place, he can issue what's called a temporary order of protection. That means one spouse is out of the house without the children. Um, very often it's a race to the courthouse. Who's going to get there first? I remember that. And those allegations that are made, be it alcohol abuse or drug abuse or physical abuse, anything like that, those are the documents that are on file with the court. So when a law guardian is, is initially appointed, the paperwork that goes to the law guardian are those allegations. I see. The law guardian doesn't know what the other side is. So the attorney for the party out of the house has to get together with the law guardian and explain the other side I of the see. story. Um, as the case progresses, uh, if it looks like the case is not going to be able to settle, the judge is uh, going to order forensic examinations. Uh, that's when a psychologist is going to become involved with the case. And their job is to be able to interview mom, dad, the children. And in a very limited time, this individual has to make a full assessment of everyone's lives that may have been going on for the last 15 or 16 years. It's a job I wouldn't want because that individual has to use his or her best judgment to try to figure out what's best for these children. I don't know how they can do it. Do I agree with all of their assessments? No. Um, that's when you are going to have to uh, get involved with some of your own forensic studies or perhaps get your own psychologist on board. But that costs money. Yes. Two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. This whole thing. I just, is you about know, money. they told me, Joanne, you need a forensic accountant. He's a tax expert. Go hire him. Hey, give me four hundred bucks an hour. Two hundred an hour for the lawyer. Four hundred an hour for the forensic psychologist, uh, uh, whatever, uh, accountant. Then I had to hire, pay fifty percent of the forensic psychologist, fifty percent of all the other experts. You know, I'm not a rich woman. No. I'd like to know how all these women got fees. I, I never heard. Do you get fees for your poor clients like me? Not often. Not okay, often. so then what happened to me is pretty, uh, pretty usual. And maybe because John is a movie actor, he had a pay. Yeah, I think that Bias. what they probably did in his case is they <clears> looked at uh, his income and determined that he should pay the whole thing. Well, he just made Home Alone, whatever it was. So, you know, it was a mo big movie. Yeah. You know, hey, the judge he makes the afford. assessment as to how those fees are going to be split. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is really, but. We ran out of time. I can't believe we ran out of time. What I'm saying is like, you've got to come back and talk more about this. I'm yeah, so confused. But anyway, Frank, thanks a lot. I, I really pleasure. appreciate your coming by. And it's a complex subject and 
and one that always confuses most of us. Those going through it and those in the family listening to it who are sick of it. Yeah. Anyway, thanks a lot. You're and welcome. Um, You're welcome. I'll see you again soon. Okay. You're up, you're up, you're up. I know that even though I'm steeped in all this um, court court stuff, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> um, one of the things I love to do is read and travel and eat and all that stuff, and I get very little time to do it. Um, but Every so often a book comes across my desk, a review copy, and it catches my eye, and that's what happened with this one. So I called up the author. The book is called The 52 Most Romantic Dates in and Around New York City. You know, those of us who are divorced, it's like we're starting over again. And um, really, um, as you know, my book, The Joy of Divorce, um, is really what got me going on this whole thing. And um, I really am much happier now, but you know, sometimes you need, like I write these travel books and you wrote this book on where to date. Okay, dating at 50 is real different than dating at 20, so you need a little help, right? Yeah. You, you forgot what it was like, it's like. So tell me, Sherry Bykovsky, is that yes, the proper right. pronunciation? Mm -hmm. What are your three or four favorite places? You have 52. These one, are my one, for, one for every week, right? right? Every, is that how you year. <laughs> And it's a great antidote to uh, your dilemma. Just find somebody to go on some romantic date with. And uh, some of my favorite places are uh, Le Refuge Inn on City Island. That is actually my number one personal favorite place. It's a bed and breakfast, and it's a very romantic French restaurant where uh, it's really weird because you're in the Bronx, but you feel like you're in the French countryside. The, the music is, is beautiful. Is City Island still, no, I been, haven't been there in 20 years. Is it still not built up? Right, it's still pretty quaint, but I, I, you don't go there just to go to City Island if you're looking for a romantic place. But this, this B and B and restaurant, Le Refuge, I recommend. A what lot. do they charge a night? It's a prefix for dinner, and uh, it's about a hundred, I think, a night. I'm not sure exactly. That's all. Yeah, it's not expensive, and they they have a a little cottage where you which. Uh, it's like a duplex college, really? and mm -hmm. they have a piano, and, oh, wow. and, and they have chamber music in the morning. I really recommend it if you want to get away. And in the city, there are so, so many places I love. That's uh, a very, very big bargain, because my, mm -hmm. um, the Sorgati's Lighthouse, mm -hmm. where you have to walk downstairs to the bathroom, <laughs> charges like 125 I, I believe, a night, yeah. even off-season. That's true. So that's that uh, and with breakfast. So that's very mm -hmm. cheap for the, the yeah, city. I, th I think that's about right. I'm not yeah. exactly so, sure um, what are the time of year. What are the others? So I like, um, in, in, Ulster, in Ulster County, I yeah. recommend uh, Innisfree Gardens. It's no, that's in Dutchess County. Oh, it's in du okay, but it's near here. It's, uh, well, we're in Dutchess. It, it's, it's in Millbrook. Uh, uh, and it is in, in, in this county. Right, it's Duchess. Right, it's right nearby. Right. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. But it is uh, the most beautiful garden, and uh, it's worth the trip from New York, from Manhattan, which right. is where I live, and that's why I put it in the book. It has sort of an oriental flavor there, to it, right? I think 36 what is the story cup there? Gardens cup make gardens. Up this, right. uh, uh, it's a beautiful area just to stroll and spend the day and have a picnic. And uh, it's, of course, seasonal. There's a little place nearby called the Happy Days Restaurant, which is like uh, just a little hop shop kind of restaurant um, for a hamburger and a milkshake. And, and Millbrook is nearby, and, Millbrook is and lest we town. forget Wings Castle, one yes. of my favorite places in the Hudson Valley. Do you gorgeous. know about Peter Wing up the road? I don't know the place exactly, but I'll check it out for my next book. But also the winery, the winery is the there too, the John Dyson's winery. Yes, that's in my other book. So those, the winery, Wings Castle, Innisfree Gardens, and the village, I mean, when I go, and also the um, uh, Arboretum. The Arboretum is, is there. So Millbrook has a lot if you can get there. But the and idea is just leave the kids with the babysitter or with the other custodial parent and <laughs> go on a romantic date any time of year and it'll make everyone happier. It'll make the kids happier too in the end too. Well listen, Sherry, I am looking forward to using the book Thank you. because um, very often I I write travel books as you know and I, right. I never, um, people rarely tell me anything I don't know. And I think this book has a few places yeah. I haven't yet discovered. Filled with secrets. So. That was my aim. 
you, you did great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming Thank you very up much from for New York me. for this. Yes, it's worth it. It's very interesting. Really? I'm glad really? I don't have to deal with any of what you're dealing with. <laughs> Hey, it's been fun. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching my show, and I hope you'll join me next time. Okay.